Hello people of the internet, welcome back to my channel or welcome to my channel if you're new. The Freeway Phantom has stayed true to their dubbed nickname and stayed a phantom. DC's first serial killer ran amok from April 1971 to October 1972 and their identity still remains a mystery today. A defining feature of the murderer is that within that year and a half of killing, he targeted young black females. Carol Spinks was the first victim and she was 13 years old. Her and her siblings were home alone when her mom was out visiting a friend that lived close by. While her mom was away, instead of staying home, she decided to run an errand to 7-Eleven. Carol's older sister had offered to let her get any soda she wanted if she had done the grocery shopping. And the store guys was only half a mile away, so it seemed safe enough. It was proven that Carol did in fact make it to the store that night. She was seen by the clerk and she was also seen by her mother. And because she was seen by her mother, she was able to file a missing persons report immediately, April 25th, 1971. So somewhere along the line between leaving the 7-Eleven and walking home, she was abducted. Her body was discovered six days later on a grassy embankment near I-295 by some kids playing. Take note that she was in the same clothes that she had disappeared in, but her shoes were missing. The autopsy had revealed that she had died from strangulation and was sexually and physically abused prior to the murder. They also found that her death had happened two or three days prior, so that means she was alive for some time after being abducted. The Freeway Phantom did leave behind some evidence. And this is the only evidence really that they have to go off of. The only evidence they found on her body to possibly connect them to a suspect was an unidentifiable green fiber on her shirt. This could have been a rug, this could have been a sweater, but again, it's unidentifiable. They couldn't determine what exactly it was. The second victim is 16 year old Darlenia Denise Johnson, who actually lived in the same neighborhood as Carol. On July 8th, 1971, she was walking to work at Oxen Hill Recreational Center around 10.30 a.m. Her disappearance was not noted until a day after because she had told her mom she was sleeping over at a friend's house. About two weeks passed before they find her body near where they found Carol's um, on the side of the highway in the same type of conditions. So she was missing her shoes and was still in the same clothes that she disappeared in. The police actually received multiple calls about the sightings of a body and they chose to ignore them. And this is honestly just one of the earlier signs of racism. And sadly, racism played a big part in the low quality police work that was done on this case. Because of the delay and the decomposition of her body, they weren't able to tell if she was sexually assaulted or not. In the autopsy. They were, however, able to conclude the cause of death, which again, like Carol, um, was strangulation. After Darlenia, the freeway phantom claimed four more victims. A Brenda Faye Crockett, a smart, responsible 10 year old girl was sent July 27th to run errands and she sadly would never return home. The safe way she went to was only five blocks from her house. So again, this seemed like a safe enough trip. After being gone for an hour, Brenda's mom goes to go search for her because she's like, this, this is weird. This, where is my kid? Three hours pass and Brenda picks up the phone and calls home and her seven-year-old sister who was left behind with her mother's boyfriend picks up. Brenda is on the other end. She is crying and she says, a white man picked me up and I'm heading home in a cab. She indicated that she thought she was in Virginia but was at least 200 miles away. All the information that was given was just off and weird and today investigators believe that this was to fool investigators so the abductor could buy himself more time. The phone call ends and a few minutes later, the phone rings again, but this time Brenda's mother's boyfriend picks up. Re Brenda is repeating a description of a man and then she blurted out, did my mother see me? And this really confused Brenda's mom's boyfriend because again, with the information she was giving, it was like, are you in Virginia? Are you not? Like, I don't, I, I don't understand. As they're talking, he hears footsteps in the background and suddenly Brenda goes, I'll see you and hangs up the phone. Brenda was found eight hours later by a hitchhiker on Route 50. Because her remains were found so quickly, they were able to get more information out. For example, the green scarf that she was wearing around her neck was used to strangle her. Unidentifiable green fibers make an appearance again and were found on her body and she had also been sexually assaulted. Brenda was not wearing shoes when she vanished, so it wouldn't be weird to find her without shoes, but her feet were not dirty. 
This led investigators to presume that someone had cleaned her feet. The next victim I'm going to refer to as Yates. Her name is beautiful. I will put it down here. I just don't want to mispronounce it or mess it up in any way. A common theme between the victims is that they were out and about. They were running errands or on their way to work and Yates was doing exactly that. She was on her way to the Safeway and whether or not she made it to the store is a mystery. A witness claimed that they had seen her getting into a blue Volkswagen, but they didn't question it because they assumed it was her father's wife's car. And this has not, like this piece of evidence has not been confirmed or denied, but I thought I would share it. And PSA, if you ever see like the neighborhood kid talking to a car, even if you think they know who that adult is, I don't know, it's never a bad thing to check. It really isn't and you never know what's going on or whose life you're potentially about to save and it's better to be safe than sorry. A grocery store clerk also claimed that they had found her groceries which were flour, sugar, and paper plates abandoned on the street outside a few minutes after she left. A teenager stumbled across her body on Pennsylvania Street in Prince George County, Maryland. When she was found, her body was still warm so that meant she had only died a couple hours ago. When examined, it had been clear that she was sexually assaulted and strangled. And again, the running theme, her shoes were missing. After Yates' murder, this is when the FBI decide to get involved because it is deemed as a repeat offender case or also known as a serial killer case. This is when the nickname Freeway Phantom was coined. The fifth victim, 18 year old Brenda Woodard was out with some friends on November 15th. She left home around 6.30 to attend a late evening class at Cortezo High School. Once that class ended, she and her friends went to dinner together at Ben's Chili Bowl. At the end of dinner, they all board the same bus together, but at some point they separate. Brenda goes off by herself because she needs to transfer buses. 5 a.m. the next morning, her body was found by a police officer in a grass embankment on Baltimore Washington Parkway. She was wearing the same clothes that she had worn the night before, including her black boots. So not only did she have black boots on, but she was sexually assaulted, strangled, and stabbed stabbed and the investigators deem this as overkill. The oldest victim stands out for so many reasons and there's more. She was found with a note in her pocket. The words written on the note were signed off by the Phantom and they read, this is a tantamount to my insensitivity to people, especially women. I will admit the others when you catch me if you can, Freeway Phantom. Now note the capitalizations, misspellings and emphasis on the note itself. The capitalizations, Honestly, it could just be how Brenda wrote those letters. And to be honest, I believe this to be the case because of the size of the lettering. It's all fairly uniform across the board. Um, so I don't think it was like a secret message. The last known victim is Diana Denise Williams, who went missing September 5th, 1972. This is notable because the Freeway Phantom took a 10 month gap between victims or at least went that long without having any connections or any killings connected to him. The aspiring model spent most of her nights with her boyfriend and at the end of those nights, he would walk her to the bus stop, kiss her goodnight and see her off. That night, however, she did not make it home. Diana was last seen at 11.30 when her boyfriend escorted her and she was found a couple hours later by I-295 with her clothes from the night before and her shoes. But I don't think her shoes were on her body. I think they were just found with her, but I am not sure about that detail. While examining her body, this pisses me off. While examining her body, the police discover semen. And because she was hanging out with her boyfriend the night before, they assumed that they had sex, but they did not. So years later, the semen is sent to Maryland State Police Department where a catastrophic mishandling of evidence, of course, happens. The state police sent the sample to the FBI, who then returned it to the Maryland State Police again years later after not testing it. Um, since then, the DNA has not officially been tested or located. In line with the entire disorganization and chaos of this investigation, the entire case file was lost. Later, Detective Tranium worked to rebuild the case by working with the Maryland State Police Department, the FBI, and Prince George County's police. He also worked with former Canadian police officer, Kim Rosemo, to determine the killer's anchor point, which is where they work 
uh, or where they live and trying to figure out like where they're based around. And they figured the freeway phantom's anchor point was Congress Heights. And there were a few reasonable suspects. The first idea thrown out was that it was a member or members of a gang called Green Vega Rapists. But after countless and extensive interviews, no evidence could be really traced back to them. There was just no reliable information and not enough of it was gathered. One member of the gang actually implicated another, but the person that they implicated had an alibi, so it didn't, it didn't stick. The most believable suspect was Robert Askin, who was convicted multiple times for violent crimes against women. The self-proclaimed woman hater sexually abused, poisoned, five prostitutes and was convicted of multiple murders before his final conviction at the age of 58 that ended up keeping him in prison for the rest of his life. No evidence was ever officially linked to Robert. It just, he seemed like the criminal who fit the case. So this case still remains unsolved today. Taking in the details of the case, the question then becomes, are all six murders connected? Is there possibly more than one killer? The argument between being linked and not being linked can go back and forth because some were found without shoes. Some were found with shoes. Some were found near the same spot. Others were found somewhere else. And the cause of death with all being strangled, but Brenda is where, again, it gets tricky because she was stabbed. Not only was she stabbed, but she also had a note. And up until that point of getting the note, the Freeway Phantom did not address the public. So with those questionable details, is there another killer who was using the Freeway Phantom to get away with their own crime? Could another killer just be using the freeway phantom as a scapegoat to throw the cops off of their trail and get away with their own crime. A rough profile was made based off of what they knew about serial killers at the time. His description was a black man in his 20s or 30s who is likely to be familiar with the area because he's comfortable. Most likely comes off as charming and appear friendly, but experiences difficulty in keeping up with relationships and is likely to have a steady job but a poor relationship with women in his life made him form resentment. Decades and decades have passed and it's tragic that no charges have been made towards this case. Who is the Freeway Phantom? And if the victims have been white, would the case be solved? I can't for sure say yes or no, but I do know if they had been, there would have been a hell of a lot more movement with media coverage and public outrage. But what do you guys think? Do you have any theories? Let me know down below. And if you have any case suggestions that you would like me to look into to make a video about, comment that too. That is all I have for you guys until next time. I hope you enjoyed learning about this case. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and all that jazz. I'll see you guys next time. Namaste. Have a nice day.